Hi, my name is Michael Wester, the VP of Product at Agile Assets, and I wanted to share with you the exciting new release of Agile Assets 7.1, which just recently became available. We're very excited about this release, and it's driven by a number of enhancements and ideas that our customers have uh, shared with us or asked for. Uh, and we've worked closely with several of you to deliver this release, and we're very excited it's here. Uh, so we thought we'd share and go over it with you uh, and introduce those of you who haven't been involved with uh, all of the features and functions that are there. Um, there are quite a few things that are in this release. The, one of the biggest things is our brand new iOS, or if you think about it, the iPad and iPhone platform, mobile apps. Uh, we've introduced two new mobile apps. One is for material management, so you could use it with maintenance, fleet, or facilities and the material management uh, capabilities that are there. It's not an exact replica of what you would see in the web app. It's designed for a, uh, an iPhone or an iPad experience. And it's a simple, straightforward uh, path through material management. It's really focused on a particular user, so it's not, you know, everybody from the, you know, somebody in charge of maintenance all the way down. It's really focused on the guy that's going to be managing the inventory, updating and handling transfers and whatnot. And then the second app is for fleet maintenance. So being able to view uh, repair orders, you know, what's needed, vehicle information, warranty information, and things like that all on the mobile device. A, uh, another new capability, and this really comes back to one of the themes that we've had for the product, is usability. Um, we've introduced what we call the Visual Project Editing Tool. And what this does is uh, gives you the ability to graphically view the projects that so are laid out for, for pavement and be able to optimize that in a very interactive visual way. So you can actually drag and drop things across years, across lanes, and consolidate projects, merge projects, uh, and really use the visual sense of what's presented rather than just looking at it in the, in the grid or tabular format. Uh, we've also introduced what we're calling the next generation mapping. It's just an evolution of GIS functionality inside of the Agile Assets products. And it really takes usability to the next level. And that's, again, one of the things driving for us is how do we improve that user experience? Uh, so we've consolidated a lot of things, we've simplified things, made it much easier for a map user to get in there. You know, for example, reporting and mapping are now tied together. It's in one place. So you can build a map and then you click print and you're going to be able to print what you're viewing on the screen. So it's much more of a what you see is what you get kind of experience. Uh, we've also got uh, enhanced integrations with Esri Roads and Highways and with XOR coming through the LRS Gateway. Uh, and continuing the usability theme, uh, we've done some work around what we call reduced chrome. No, it's not chrome plating like you've got on a car. Uh, in a UI perspective, we refer to chrome as all those extra things that aren't necessary. Uh, we've done some things around improving uh, the interactivity and the experience on a tablet device, so like an iPad or an Android tablet when you're running Agile assets through the browser on those devices. Responsive UI is also one of those things that's uh, involved there and some, some enhancements behind the scenes for what we call page-to-page -page linking. And then, of course, there's a lot of smaller things that you'll run into as you start using it. You go, oh, they fixed this, uh, or they did something with this, and this changed. And they're, they're the small little tweaks, and you know, we realize that those are usually the things that make a difference. And there's a lot of those, and they are documented in the release notes uh, for the product. Uh, and then it goes without saying that there are a lot of fixes that are incorporated here. Uh, you know, as we've worked with all of you, there are things we said, you know, we'll, we'll tackle that in the 7.1 release, and those fixes are there. So uh, that's enough from a summary perspective. We'll just jump right into the details of these. And the first one up is the material management app. And like I mentioned, it's targeted at the individual that's going to be updating the inventories. So from in there, they can, you know, they can see what transfers are coming in, what transfers need to go out. They have the ability to fulfill a transfer request if it's one being made of them or make a request outward. If they record a transfer, like let's suppose they go out and buy windshield wipers, they can record that purchase inside of the mobile app. And then also uh, fulfilling a reconciliation. So, uh, you know, going out and, and measuring and, and updating inventory quantities uh, within the warehouse. So they can do all that from inside the, the iOS app. And like I mentioned before as well, it is for the iPhone and iPad. It doesn't work on, uh, you know, a Windows desktop. It doesn't work on an Android device today. And it's, it will be available in the iTunes App Store as soon as we can clear the Apple certification process. It usually takes a little bit of time. And it should go without saying is it does require 7.1. So if you're on 7.0 or a prior version, you do have to upgrade to 7.1 in order for these apps to work with uh, your web system. It is These apps are not standalone. They work tightly with the web system uh, and just really is just another interface or a way to interact with the system. The fleet maintenance app as well has quite a bit of functionality in it. So, for example, you're able to manage repair orders for vehicles, and you can see some of the screens here. So I have the ability to search and find these. I can update material equipment, labor, and other cost aid cards. 
So from in here, I can update the information. You know, what did I use? Um, how long did it take? Who did the work? All of that information can be captured from the mobile device. I can view vehicle and warranty information so that, uh, you know, if I'm working on a vehicle, I can see the, de the details on, on those things, and those will show up right here inside of the mobile app. Uh, and I'm going to go back, and I forgot to mention it actually on, come back here a little bit, on the materials management app. The, both apps really start to take advantage of what's going on because the device is mobile. You can start to take advantage of some of the device capabilities. For example, on the materials management app, you can use the uh, camera as a barcode scanner. So you can actually scan barcodes on inventory, and that will pull up the, the item, and you'll actually be able to update it quantity. So you can go out into the warehouse, scan something, and pull up that information. So really looking at how do we take advantage of what the device provides, not just using the device as a way to, you know, take what we have on the web and showcase it in a smaller environment. Um, the visual project editing tool, as I mentioned earlier as well, is, is really a, an enhancement to make vi uh, project planning, uh, especially in complex environments over multi-year periods, uh, much simpler. You know, when you want to look at it in a table format, it's really hard to start to extract and see, you know, we've got a uh, project happening on, you know, within the same, let's say, 20-mile range of highway, but instead of getting it all done in one time, we've got it scattered over five years. Uh, and so this makes it really easy to visualize those things, uh, pull those things together, and then be able to, to manage and say, okay, let's just take that whole project on in, in one year and we'll move other things around. So the visual project editing tool, as it says, is very visual. You have the ability to add new projects. You can view costs, specify project location, implementation year, and, and other things like that, and just do that from a graphical perspective. So to give you an idea of it here is I've taken a couple screenshots just to illustrate how this would work. So down the left-hand side, you've got your, your years and the information about which lanes you're using, and then you've got your segments over uh, going across time, or across not across time, across the, the width of the screen here. And so you can see there's a number of projects scheduled. There are various times. What we want to do is we actually look at here in, in 2014 and 2015, we have seal coat happening roughly in the same area. One of them, it's repetitive uh, after doing it in 2012. Um, we also have it in 2013 happening a little bit later. So we can actually pick up each of those bars and drag them so that they all start to come up there on the same lane. You know, so we're looking at uh, the left lane one. We'll drag all those together, put them up there, and then we actually have the ability to here I can see them all together, and then I can actually merge those all into one activity. So from a planning perspective, it makes it much simpler. Instead of having six of those projects or however many it was, I now have one project. It's all there together. It's all for lane one, and I've pulled it out of those other years. I also could take it and say, you know what? I want to do this across all three lanes over all of these segments, and I'm going to do it all in 2012. And so I can actually drag that one little line across the other two lanes so now, it, you know, again, just using drag and drop with my mouse, resize it so that it now covers all three lanes. So it allows me to merge the project and then uh, move it around. I could also pick this up and you know, drag it to the right, drag it to the left if those weren't the, the segments of roadway that I actually wanted to do something with. Another visual effect and a visual treatment that, you know, from a usability perspective is, I mentioned, the GIS or next generation mapping capabilities. Uh, from top to bottom inside the application, this is brand new for us. Um, and it does require a little bit of migration on your part to recreate maps uh, as you go to 7.1. Just give you some idea there. So because it does use a completely new uh, technology stack, it actually also makes it much easier in doing that. So instead of us being much more proprietary about the way we address things, this is now something that works much more easily with uh, Esri's tool set. Uh, we appear as just another ArcGIS server to, ArcGIS, or to Esri and ArcGIS environment. So uh, those in your organization that are using ArcGIS online can put in the information they need to, and they can see the maps and layer information that's coming right out of Agile Assets. And vice versa, we can look at what's in uh, ArcGIS Online and pull those things in as layers and lay those on top of information like, you know, we wanted to pull in utility information that another part of the, the another agency has created, pull that in, show it on top of project information, and all of a sudden now you've got really useful information by pulling those two things together with layers that wouldn't have typically ever been in Agile Assets. But you're able to do that through the ArcGIS uh, and the updates here to our technology that make that much easier. The UI itself has been really designed to simplify the UI without taking away a lot of the power. Um, you know, what we heard from a lot of customers is really difficult to get in there, learn how to use this. And then, you know, as soon as you built a map you liked, you had to go somewhere else to try and build a report uh, and print that information. And so we've consolidated all those things here together into one view. It's made, again, simplistically clean UI so that you can do this from a tablet just as easily as you could uh, from the desktop. 
So zooming in a little bit more and kind of give you a little bit of an orientation to this, on the left side here um, is what we call the layer panel. And so I just click up there at the top right here, it says text.demo map. And if I go back, you'll see that's collapsed. If I click that text.demo map, it pulls down the layer panel and I can see the layers that have been created here. You'll notice that there are little green eyes next to each of those. That's how I toggle on and off a layer. So if I wanted to toggle off medium and low, I would just click those, the eye would turn green and that layer information would go away from this particular map. So very straightforward, simple way of, of modifying these things. If you had multiple layers there and you actually wanted to group them together, you could create a group and put these things together in that. Uh, you wouldn't even have to do what we've got here where we've got summary, you know, the road condition in high, medium, low. That can all be done with one layer and then just using Unix styles for the values to actually draw those all in one layer. So you know, here we were just playing with it to build a, a map and be able to toggle things easily on and off from visual perspective. Uh, makes it really simple. Down there at the bottom left, you can see base maps. Uh, you actually can be able to click down there and it'll pop up a, a graphical display with a preview of all of the different base maps, swap out the base map and use a base map that you like. So if your agency has a standard base map it wants, you load that in and then you're able to switch between that and the other base maps that are available. Um, so pretty simple, straightforward. Up at the top, you click add layer and then you can come in here and create a new layer. You select the layer from the layer catalog and add that put layers on top of each other. So if you had multiple things in here and you're like, oh, you know, I want to see uh, active projects, uh, and that was below layer condition, you'd be seeing layer condition information on top of that. So you maybe toggle some things off, toggle some things on, reorder, and you'd be good to go. Uh, so like I mentioned, you click the either open or the add layers, you'll get their respective catalogs. Here, if I click um, open, which is the second icon over there, I get the map catalog and I can pick from any one of the maps that are available. I have the foldering structure, I don't have it here in, the, in this screenshot. Uh, but you can create folders, organize the maps the way you want to, and this allows you to just come in, grab one, click it, and it'll open up as the new map here that you're looking at. Um, so I can do that, I can go into the layers themselves. So the layer panel, if I click on the PMIS condition summary medium, uh, when I go into that, I can actually see filters and create the filters here. We're using uh, various attributes as well as the year. So we're looking at 2014's condition information and it's styling everything yellow that's between a score of 50 and 75. So if I clicked on styles, I would be able to see the styling was set to yellow for things in that value. So it's using simple styles. Unique styles, as I mentioned, would give you all of this together in one layer and you wouldn't have to create these condition scores here. The styling would take care of that for you. So up in the top, top right corner, I should mention, and go kind of across the, the icons there, you've got new, which clears everything and just leaves you with your base map, and then you can add layers and build the map the way you'd like. Uh, open, which allows you to open a map from your saved maps. Save, obviously lets you save the map uh, back to the system so that others can use it or you can use it at another time. And print pops up, allows you to pick a print template. Which template do you want to use? Uh, we've consolidated with the other reporting capabilities inside Agile Assets and now you can build any number of templates you want using Jasper uh, and then use those inside of here to pull the, the what you see, what you get kind of approach to the map, drop it onto a full page that's also formatted or templated with other data you want uh, there and then be able to just print it out or save it as a PDF. The other things you see up there, at the top you see district. So that is what we call the area of interest filter. So I can come in here and highlight, select, and say a particular district, what do I want to see? So if I wanted to, you know, you see Austin here in the middle. Uh, if I wanted to select that district, then I just filter here and then I could click the little crop button and it actually crops everything else and fades everything else away. So all I see is that one particular district. The far right is the route filter. And so that allows me to filter on particular routes. I can go type the, the name of the route in there and it's gonna show and highlight things just along that route. When I use route filter along with the area of interest, I only see routes that are available inside of that area. So if I selected a particular area of interest and that a route did not go through there, it would not show up in the route filter for me. So a little bit of intelligence there in the mapping make it simple for users. So they can come in, they can view their maps, they view the same maps all the time, uh, open up their map, they, you know, the district and the, the route filters uh, will persist and be there as well. So here's a little bit on styling. So in this case here, you can see I've got the, the styling on district boundaries and I've set it up with a solid outline boundary with the point four. It's that dark gray line you see around all of the, what would, it appears here as districts. Uh, so you can see there's a large one around Austin, one up around Waco, one down around San Antonio. Those are districts and this is how I style and I've given it that light uh, cream color fill. So those two things are here and set up as the, the way this 
this particular layer is styled. Uh, other things I can do, obviously come in here, you know, I can take routes and I can style those and I can change things. I can change the width and that quickly, you can see tile going back and forth here, changing it from 0.5 to one, you know, pretty quickly you see it change there in the UI. So um, as I style this thing, everything as I change it, and one of the reasons I have the layer panel as it is, is as I make changes to the layers and the definition of those layers, it automatically reflects and shows it to me in the map. There's not a case of go pick, style it, then come back to the map. Everything is side by side here. So I can style something, I could print it. I go back in, I could change a filter, I could print it. I could go back in, change the area of interest and say I want to look at a different area, I want to look at a particular county, fade everything else out, print it. And so it really is focused on simplicity and, and the usability here, just make this all one place. So everywhere there's maps inside 7.1, this is how they'll work. You get a very simple, crisp, clean, usable experience for everybody inside uh, the Agile Asset Solution. As I mentioned as well, one of the other things that's here is the new uh, Esri Roads and Highways integration. This is something that we have rolled out prior. It is in 7.1, so everybody going forward gets it in 7.1, but we also made it available in the Service Pack 2 updates that came out over the last, I want to say, six, seven months. Uh, so the different service packs include support for Esri Roads and Highways. Uh, Esri Roads and Highways is a separately licensed, or the integration to it is a separately licensed piece of software, as well as a uh, services engagement. But we want to make sure everybody understands it is available now, and it works with Service Pack 2 and later, as well as 7.1. So whichever version of those you're on, that's where you want to get to uh, if you want to be integrating uh, Agile assets with Esri Roads and Highways for LRS. Uh, also, there are the usability improvements that we have made. Uh, the responsive layout, which makes uh, resizing of the windows a little bit more intelligent so that the things don't cram on top of each other. The toolbars simplify, the menu simplifies, uh, and takes advantage of the lower real estate so things don't try and cram in. I know it, when I first looked at the solution and you ran, tried to pull it up in a browser on an iPhone, for example, the menus itself can take up the entire screen. And so it gets a lot smarter and more responsive. So based off you're using it on a desktop with a high resolution or you're using it on a on a tablet, it resizes intelligently. Uh, and some of the things that we can control uh, pick that up as well. Uh, going hand in hand with that are some of the behaviors on a tablet. Uh, you know, clicking with a mouse pointer versus clicking with your finger. Uh, with a mouse pointer, the clickable area can be pretty small and it's still pretty easy to hit. With your finger, when it's that small, it's very hard to get the exact point on it. And so we've made clickable areas in some places a little bit larger. So for drop downs, for example, it makes it easier. We also changed some of the behavior so that um, when you're in there and you're looking at, let's say, a drop down that requires text, in the past what happened is when that dropped up, it would then kick up the keyboard above that, hiding the list, and then you couldn't see the value you wanted to select. So we've gotten a little bit more uh, intelligent about how that will work so that it doesn't hide the options from you and you're able to pull, get the drop down and then be able to pick the values out of it. So, And then we also did what we call reduced the Chrome. Uh, so, for example, in the in the top toolbar, what we realized is, especially on tablets, it gets highlighted a lot. Or when you're running at a resolution where, you know, 1024 by 768 or one of those resolutions, the toolbar and a lot of those types of things takes up a lot of real estate, which takes away from the workable area in the UI. And so we've actually focused on how do we reduce that area? And I think we've pulled about, um, I want to say it's about 60% of the Chrome out. So there's still Chrome there, but we've tried to simplify quite a bit so that none of the value has gone away. You can still get to information about who the user is, what the state is, what messages are going on, how the menus work. Uh, but we've consolidated that to make it much simpler and easier on, on the user so they're not distracted with things they don't need uh, or they're taking up a lot of real, real estate. You know, we, with a 60% improvement there, we can you know, fit several more rows of data into a page uh, making it much easier for people to do their jobs. So there are also a lot of other little features that are inside the version, uh, you know, focused on usability, little enhancements people made. I always call those the little rocks. You know, those are the things that are easy to fit in around the big things that we've done uh, and really make a difference in, in how people use the software. So again, this is a release that we're very excited about. Uh, we're very excited to see how you respond to it and what you think of it. Uh, and we're always open to hearing more requests and enhancements of what you'd like to see. Uh, the team is actively working on the next release already. Uh, and pretty soon we'll start up the end of Sprint demos and allow you to see uh, the work as it progresses on the next release of software. If you have any questions, again, my name is Michael Lester. I'm the VP of product. My email address is there for you as well, and I'd be happy to answer any of your questions uh, or be able to explain uh, the features and, and things that have shown up in 7.1. So thank you for paying attention and uh, look forward to hearing